thank you very much, uh, Eop, for the presentation. Um, first of all, we want to thank, as ECA, the government of Ethiopia for agreeing to do this and for suggesting to do this with us at the ECA. I think what we have seen today is um, the Economic Homegrown Program for Ethiopia, which has a very large ambition. And Eop, you have used the word ambition a lot. The scale of the ambition is high. What we're going to do is go through a few presentations, and I will want you to remember three numbers by the time we're done today. But let's start with the scale of the ambition. I think Ethiopia says that they want to grow from 800 GDP per capita. At the end of the day, it is about the people. That is why we care about GDP per capita. GDP per capita today is 865. They want to get to 2,219. That has been done before. Next slide. So we, what we decided to do was just take a look at countries, see what they have done before, and whether Ethiopia can actually meet that target. There are a couple of countries that have done that, China, Laos, and Vietnam. And I think we wanted to put together, and as I think the Prime Minister said and EOP also said, part of why we are here is to bring the international comparisons to show you what is happening across the world. China, of course, was able to double a normal, uh, GDP per capita in a 10-year period, so a little bit... Uh, uh, the same time frame that you're looking at. But more importantly, I think we was also able to contain inequality. And we want to look at that, which is why we have put the Gini coefficient there as a number that you should be looking at. Vietnam, which is a country that Kerry knows well, uh, is also a country that has been able to almost double uh, GDP per capita, but while actually reducing inequality. So again, there is uh, a best practice there that we can look at. And I think that the Vietnam example for Ethiopia could be something that is quite interesting, because particularly when we start looking at structural reforms and what has happened. Laos, of course, has done the same. And in some areas and in some sectors, I think there is quite uh, a lot of comparison between Laos and, and, and Ethiopia that one could look at. GDP per capita went from 700 to 1300, so almost doubling. So we see that this is possible and it, it's uh, one can do that. Next slide. So again, the scale of the ambition is doable. I think we start with that and we say that this is not too ambitious, actually. It is something that has been done before. What does Ethiopia need to do that? This is the second number that I want you to remember, and this was your closing slide. You almost need to do $6 billion of, in, of new investment annually. And that means, and you said it a lot, you are now at 34% uh, in, in GDP investments to GDP. Many other countries have done that. China has been investing during its growth periods, almost 40%. Uh, Mauritania, which has been growing quite fast as well. We wanted to look at a few African countries. There is one African country that has doubled uh, GDP per capita. It was Equatorial Guinea, I think, so we decided not to use it because it's a very specific type of economy, but there is one African, African country that has done that. There are many African countries that have reduced poverty by 10% uh, in 10 years, so that is also doable in terms of what one can do. But I think on the investment part, you need the 6 billion of new investment. With 34% debt to GDP or investments to GDP now, you need another 4, 4% or $4 billion of reduction in your debt. Your savings are doing well, and you're, I think, investing more or less the same as China and Vietnam were doing when they were growing. But you've also said that it's the efficiency question. If you're investing at 34% uh, uh, GDP, there is no way that you should not be growing at two digit consistently. So when you ask the question, it means that somewhere in there, there is inefficiencies, and it's the SOE reforms that you've been talking about that I suppose one needs to do. Next slide. So again, government revenues, 20%. When China, Laos, and Vietnam were growing at the pace at which they were growing, with the same investments to GDP, they were having as well uh, revenue to GDP that was slightly higher than 20%. So you do need to raise that ambition and you have already said that you're going to be doing that. So again, I think this is about answering your question about is it too ambitious and we're saying no, it's not. It's doable and you have demonstrated that you can do it. Next slide. On the debt problem, and this is a big one, uh, um, Clearly, and what we tried to do again was show that there is no linear path to, to sort of the debt question growth and, and the ambition that you have. If you look at this graph, China was able to reduce from almost 40% debt to GDP in 1992 to about something below 11% today. So they did their growth, but with that reduction. Vietnam did the opposite. Vietnam did growth with some increase in debt, but creating always fiscal space. So even though their debt, as you say, 
was a little bit like yours at 30-40%, the interest rate on the debt was much lower than where you are today. So they didn't have a question of debt distress. Your debt uh, uh, to the GDP levels have been going on an upward trend, but more importantly, it's the speed of the increase. And so we believe that if you need to meet the kinds of targets that you're going to meet, then you need to do some contraction of the increase in the speed of accumulation of debt. Now, if you want to do $6 billion of investment to meet this ambitious target, you almost need to, calculating the numbers, reduce your debt by $4 billion a year. So in total, you need $10 billion. I'm looking at Kerry. Uh, 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 and the rest of the donor community. <laughs> I'm, look, I'm looking at Kerry. So you need $10 billion of new investment. Of course, that is going to be a combination of uh, uh, domestic resource mobilization. We know that you can increase your domestic resources by 12 to 20 percent and uh, uh, there is a number of things that can be done uh, in that area, including in particular reducing uh, tax incentives, including in the agriculture sector. So I do not believe that you should be giving taxes to everybody in the agriculture sector. In the structural reform area, you have gone through them. I just want to take one because we only have five minutes one sector that could sort of represent everything that you're doing, and if I may, I'll take two, uh, uh, energy. On the macroeconomic side, we need to fix the FX, because you're not going to get any investments in the energy sector or private sector investments if you do not fix the FX requirements. We decided to take a look quickly at the countries that I have shown you. The ambition is real, the ambition is possible, the ambition is doable. China, Vietnam and Laos have done it. But access to energy in those countries is 100%. Access to energy in Ethiopia at best is 44%. If you start to looking at reliability and shortages and all, it's a little bit less. So clearly that is where you have a substantial binding constraint. If you wanted to use the energy sector, and we encourage and hope that that's a sector that you use, you didn't talk about it a lot, as one of the sectors where you do your three-pillar reform on the macro side, the FX is particularly important to crowd in private sector uh, investment. I think the beautiful thing about the energy sector is that we've all done it before. We know how to do private sector investment in the energy sector. Any country that has succeeded on the continent, including in the doing business, has done IPPs in the energy sector. And I think Ethiopia needs to begin to do some IPPs in the energy sector and close them. You have a couple in the pipeline. And I think, again, the scale of the ambition will be measured by a few quick wins. I think the energy sector, and I don't know if Minister Seleshi is here, is clearly one sector where we can, I think, move forward, move quickly and demonstrate it. On the macro side, it will be the FX for the energy sector. The doing business, you're doing an amazing job on the doing business side. But again, for the energy sector, ensuring that you have PPPs that are well negotiated, that you have a public-private agreement that is transparent, that the opening of the bids works well, is going to be particularly important. And I think everybody's looking at Ethiopia to do that, do it well and do it quickly. So you do have, I think, a few, uh, in the next few months on the energy sector, I think even faster than in the ICT sector, the telecom sector, you can actually demonstrate, I think, uh, a sense of credibility of the reform package. I think what everybody will be looking for, what the private sector will be looking for, is credibility in the reform package. If you can do the energy sector reforms, you will get that kind of credibility. And finally, on the structural side, in the energy sector, it's the tariff reforms and reforming uh, EEP. I think, again, we need to make sure that we look and see that the tariff reforms in that area, which are sectoral reforms, but which are critical for the energy sector, work well. So what I have done is take one sector and just break down the macro, the structural, and the uh, sectoral reforms and say, if you do that quick win in the next four months, I think this ambition becomes, begins to have legs and begins to become credible. And then I think that Kerry can give you the 10 billion that you need. I think the reason that we're all here today is essentially to talk about this number, which is 10 billion. And that is the 10 billion is the gap. It's 6 billion of new investment and 4 billion of debt reduction. But I think it is particularly important to worry about the speed of the accumulation of the debt. Because if you continue to accumulate your debt the way you're doing it now, you will already fall into high debt distress in the next two years. And then a lot of the structural reforms that you put in place will not bring in the private sector because you will not be a creditworthy country. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Vera. Um, Vera and I nearly always agree on pretty much everything. So uh, Vera has uh, taken the wind out of my sails in saying much of what I would have said. Um, I'm actually not going to focus on the 10 billion because, uh, oh, you want me to stand up? 
Um, I'm not going to focus on the 10 billion because Annika is um, speaking on behalf of the DAG. I'm just going to talk, uh, make a few points from the World Bank perspective. Um, and I want to start by congratulating the government of Ethiopia um, on the honest retrospective look. We, we would agree that much has been achieved, the poverty reduction, the growth, the human, human capital advances. Um, but we would also agree with the assessment of uh, the challenges that have arisen from that model. And we uh, do agree with the government that now is the time probably to move from this uh, model of, of, of growth and development, which is, based, which is driven by public investment, um, to one that is now driven by uh, private sector investment because it's that kind of model that will both um, uh, keep your debt manageable, as, as Vera spoke to, and will, will create the kind of um, jobs that are in demand in Ethiopia over the coming years. So congratulations on, on the honesty, the kind of long, hard look at both the past and, and the challenges of the future. I also want to uh, congratulate the government on, uh, on the ambition for the future. As Vera has said, uh, deeply ambitious. Is it achievable? It's achievable with um, a very, very uh, uh, committed, incredible reform program. There are examples around the world of, of how to do this. Um, and so, um, yeah, broadly it's, it's achievable, maybe not precisely achievable, but broadly achievable in, in, in direction. And um, I encourage the government to keep, keep that sense of ambition as you go forwards and implement these reforms. Not least because some of the reforms that, uh, that uh, State Minister Eop has referred to, some of them are quite challenging. So you're going to have to kind of remain committed uh, throughout, throughout this period, even when, when some of these uh, reforms seem quite tough to do. Um, and I also want to commend uh, the government on the level of thoughtfulness that has gone through this. I know that a lot of um, data analysis has underpinned the, uh, both the uh, analysis of the diagnosis of the past uh, successes and challenges and looking forward to the future and thinking and scoping out the forward pathway. So, so congratulations on the thoroughness of the, of the uh, homegrown reform strategy. Um, I, I think on the World Bank side, we very much appreciate this approach of coming together with a homegrown strategy. Um, I think it's very good in terms of it's very good in terms of approach because it identifies the the comprehensiveness of everything that will need to be done. Um, State Minister Eob spoke to the pillars, um, but the pillars will need coordination both over time. That means in terms of figuring out what you do in the short term and the medium term and the long term in order to build a reform path that is totally sustainable. But it also requires coordination across those different pillars. And to go back to uh, the energy sector example that Vera gave, um, you, you can do the energy sector reforms, but you can only really do um, the energy sector reforms if you look at the, the debt that's um, accumulated in the energy sector, so you need to look at uh, Dr. Yanaga's sector as well, the financial sector, in order really to, to make sure that, that progress is made and that, um, that you have a sustainable pathway forward. So connectivity across the macro, the structural and the, and the um, sectoral areas of reform will be uh, very important, just as coordination over time, deciding what, what happens first, what happens second, what, what happens in the outer years. Um, on the content side, um, we, we very much agree with the, the pillars that have been identified, the need to, the need to look at these, these different levels of reform. Um, and we will, uh, we will structure our own, well, the government has to structure their own investments along those lines, both in the, in the, the, the reform side and in the public investment side, we will also support in that way. So we, um, in the World Bank, support the government of, of um, Ethiopia with budget support to support the reform environment and the reform framework. But we will also um, bring 
targeted investment to the different sectors. If I give an example, we've been working with the government of Ethiopia on telecom sector reform, but we've just completed a preparation mission for, um, for a team who's going to do a dedicated um, digital economy project that can bring in some of the, some of the public sector investment um, that Dr. Eob referred to on the uh, development of the digital economy side. And those should, should connect together to, to mean that you can really make headway on your, on your um, uh, digital development side to get the reform side and the investment side together. Um, I, I just want to note a point that, um, that didn't come up in this. I think you know, having this launch and socialising the reform programme um, in the domestic arena with the civil society and private sector, as you did last year, and then doing the same with the international sector, as you're doing today, is, is very, very laudable and bold. Um, I hope that the government can keep coming back to us as you go forwards and uh, implement your reform program. I hope you can come back to us um, and report on your progress. I think many in this room would welcome having that regular update. I would just say in order to do that, and I'm, I'm looking at uh, Dr. Fitzham here, in order to do that you really need first class um, statistics. Um, you need statistics available in a very timely manner so that you have the feedback loop, loops that can tell you that what is working and what is not working and so you can tweak and adjust uh, your program as needed in order to um, uh, pick up on any challenges that are arising. So I would, um, I would suggest that uh, uh, it's important to try and build in uh, enhancements to both the quantity and quality of data that are collected in order to be able to keep the uh, reform strategy well informed. And then finally, I, I guess I would say that um, I think this is a really very fine sense of direction. Um, the devil will lie in the detail um, and there's going to be so many details <laughs> to work out how to take these kind of broader headlines into, into reality and into practice. Um, we look forward to helping you think through some of those questions um, and how to really make sure that the implementation um, is effective. Um, so with that, I would like to thank uh, His Excellency Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and uh, my colleagues in the government of, um, of Ethiopia and wish you all um, a happy new year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable Prime Minister, Ministers, Governor, Excellencies, and colleagues. Um, it's an honor to be able to, to participate in this event, and thank you very much for the opportunity to provide some brief reflections on today's presentation. Well, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the government uh, for developing a reform plan that is comprehensive, as, as Kerry has mentioned, and it is based on sound diagnostics and and uh, analysis, and I, I, I found uh, the analysis to be extremely candid, uh, and so the government is to be congratulated for that. Also for its ongoing uh, outreach efforts that we're seeing here uh, today. Uh, the plan uh, lays out uh, Ethiopia's impressive achievements over the past 15 years, and we commend the past successes in realizing high economic growth, poverty reduction, and improvements in health and education indicators. But the plan also presents a clear analysis of the limits of this model. We generally concur with the analysis presented today uh, by the state minister, uh, which highlighted that public investment driven model uh, has been accompanied by a rapid accumulation of debt, uh, foreign exchange shortages, and has crowded out the private sector. Now, uh, we welcome the comprehensive approach to reforms outlined in today's presentation uh, and agree that progress is needed on many fronts, including both macro and micro ref uh, reforms, as state, the state minister called it, a three-legged stool. Uh, we need these to boost productivity and private investment and to achieve the sustainable growth that uh, Ethiopia is, is, is moving towards. Another aspect of the reforms that the strategy presented today gets right is the need uh, to search for a more permanent fix to imbalances and the need to work on improving institutions. 
It is fine to take measures to address imbalances in a one-off fashion. Indeed, short-term cyclical fiscal and monetary uh, policies are often needed. But these gains will be short-lived unless the appropriate policy framework is put in place to ensure that these imbalances don't re-emerge. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, in the short run, reining in the public sector deficit through limits on borrowing helps to improve debt dynamics, which, you know, by the way, this is a policy that the government is already implementing and has, has begun bearing fruits. But this needs to be coupled with institutionalized processes to improve efficiency of public investment and reforms to make SOEs more efficient, both of which are elements of the, of the uh, reform strategy that was presented uh, today. Consider another example. Tightening monetary policy to reduce inflation is necessary, but this needs to be coupled with reforms to create tools and structures that allow the national bank to control inflation more efficiently in the future. Again, we saw that uh, according to today's presentation, this strengthening of the monetary policy framework is something that the authorities plan to pursue. This underscores, uh, to use the authorities' own words, the need to upgrade policy and institutional frameworks. This is the type of soft infrastructure needed to complement Ethiopia's past investment in hard infrastructure, such as roads and ports, and maximize the return on these past investments. It is also worth noting that changes in policy frameworks will create implementation challenges and require continued efforts by development partners to support capacity building. The final point that I would like to make is that while today's presentation provides a very informative overview of the reform program, as Kerry mentioned, details will matter greatly. In this context, it is very important that the reform plan be accompanied by a quantitative analysis that, which estimates the impact of reforms on key macroeconomic variables. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, what are the revenue gains expected from individual revenue reforms? What is the growth impact of efforts to reduce inflation and debt? Indeed, this quantitative analysis will be essential to determining the sequencing and pace of reforms. To conclude, um, I have only been in Ethiopia a short time, uh, but I am struck by the strong commitment of the authorities to ongoing reform efforts and the substantial interest by the foreign and domestic private sector to invest in this fast-growing economy. Steadfast implementation of the plan presented today would ensure that Ethiopia is able to sustain its impressive economic performance for some time to come. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. And um, honorable, honorable Prime Minister, Ministers, uh, Excellences and colleagues, it's great to be here today and it's, it's a big day for all of us to uh, get this fantastic presentation uh, on the homegrown economic reforms. Uh, it's uh, important uh, to have this transparency and openness between us so that we can learn and discuss together and and uh, my name is Annika Nordin Jayavardene. I'm the chairperson, one of the co-chairs in the DAG group. So I'm not the country director for the DAG group. So Caroline uh, and I, we share this, so we are co-chairs and we are about 22 donors in the DAG groups. Uh, the World Bank is a member and represents the multilateral donors as a co-chair and I represent the bilateral donors. I'm from Sweden uh, and we will be with you for the next year, the 2012 year, will be Carrie and I that will be leading the DAG group and we do enjoy it. Uh, so now uh, this task has come to us to, as a group, uh, respond to your request. You're talking about 10 billion uh, US dollars for reforms of macro, at macro level, structural level and sectoral level uh, to create pro-jobs, pro-growth, pro-inclusivity, inclusive, inclusivity, uh, 
And uh, for me, that is so fantastic to hear about this and so fantastic to think about this journey that we will do together. Uh, and we will have to see how that journey is going to travel and we will have to learn more uh, on where it's going. I think we have learned quite a lot today. We have got some very competent comments uh, from, from the three colleagues here. And um, I just wanted to add one part of it, which is that when you do reforms, economic reforms, you don't do it in isolation. There is also all the other reforms that are going on, which are so important. And uh, as you know, all the development partners and Ethiopia have signed up to the sustainable development goals. And there we are talking about economic, so social and ecolo ecological development, sustainable development. Uh, and that is a challenge that needs to be going on as Ethiopia is now moving to uh, a new, more private sector-led uh, transition. And uh, it's very encouraging to see uh, what has uh, come out here. And, um, and it was a very good presentation that we listened to. And uh, uh, Dr. Job, it was uh, so interesting also to see the focus on the poor people. And, and the focus on creativity in people. And, and I think it's so important. And also, I'm happy for the new civil society law that there is a possibility for people to be engaged and be involved. And, and people's voice has really been put forward in other reforms. So I can see that promoting private sector engagement and promoting uh, creativity is promoting people to be involved and engaged. And some people will be involved and engaged in business. Some will find jobs that already exist. Some will need to go to education to improve their skills so that they can get jobs. But finally, uh, there will be jobs for everyone and that will be a middle-income country. Uh, and that's where you are striving towards. And you're also striving to do this through growth continued growth and uh, we are impressed with the growth that has happened before in the country and um, we look forward to see the more private sector led growth and the space for the private sector that you're talking about. Uh, as donors we will uh, look further to, um, to the plans. Uh, if I look at how, how big the World Bank budget support is, you are really talking about that you need six times that amount. Uh, and it's good to be ambitious. So let's see what donors together can contribute. We are not there yet to, to say that, of course. <laughs> uh, what we also look for in the reform plan is to also see the action points and what my colleagues here were talking about, the details, the action points and indicators. And, and so that one can discuss and see what the plans, what are they leading to as action points. Maybe that's always what donors always ask for, but it's a way of seeing, uh, seeing what will, what you are planning going to lead to, and we can assess the plan through the action points and the indicators. Uh, having said that, it's extremely good to have this big framework now, and the well thought out framework, as I learned from my colleagues and as I learned from, from you, uh, to align behind. That's the way to attract donors, when there is a framework that we can align behind. So, so you've done your share on that, and thank you very much. And now there is the details that is coming. We are also, uh, as donors, happy to engage in dialogue about the reforms. And we have our sector working groups in the different line ministries. and. Uh, they stand ready also to be involved when it comes at sector level and also the macroeconomic group stands ready to be part in dialogue. As heads of agencies, we are ready to be part in dialogue in the high level dialogue meeting and we already have these structures. Um, and uh, finance is one thing, very important, but the other one is also institutions. Uh, and there, are, there is need for reform of institutions across the sectors. And as donors, we also stay ready to analyze 
what has been done in terms of capacity building and institutional development and what needs to be done more in that field. And as we heard here, statistics is important, monitoring and evaluation, uh, and uh, small short-term studies as you go on in the implementation of the reforms. Do short-term studies to see are we doing the right things, can we adjust? So we don't always just think of the big evaluations and the long studies for a long period, uh, but learn by doing. And, uh, and I think that is when it becomes really homegrown, because then it's sensitive to the local context. And learn about success and failures. And I think uh, I appreciate very much that it has been so open here today to talk about success and failures. And I think that's also a way forward for, for success. And uh, I think overall we need to embrace learning together. And, uh, and I think that's, that's also a way of doing reform, and I can see that that can happen here. Um, as donors, we have a way we need to be better in coordination, to work more effective together, and you will help us to coordinate by, by taking a lead of these sector working groups and uh, work together uh, with us. So I, I look forward to see this coming, and uh, we are partners in this. Thank you very much.